Good morning, everyone. Stand if you would. Find someone around you and make them feel welcome this morning. Give them the right hand of Christian fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. How is everybody doing this morning? Good. Glad y'all are here. Glad that you've chosen to come and worship with us this morning. Uh, a few announcements. Church on the Rock does a prison ministry. All right, and they have asked uh, other neighboring churches, 
jail ministry. Jail ministry. They have asked other neighboring churches uh, in the community if they, if we would, if the churches would like to help with that endeavor. And so tomorrow at Church on the Rock at 12 p.m., there's going to be an information meeting. Uh, there is paperwork uh, that if you need, you can see Tanya. Uh, if you're going to go to the jail, yes. So that Tanya is in possession of... Exactly, exactly. All right. Some of us are a little sketchy, right? So, all right, you need that form. All right. Um, also, coming up today, all right, at 4 p.m., we have our men's Bible study in the uh, Old Fellowship Hall. Also, we, a uh, few weeks ago, announced that, or came to the decision that as a church, uh, through our scholarship committee, we were going to offer financial aid to families who wanted their children to be able to attend Limestone Christian Academy uh, for, for church members. If you are interested in applying for that financial aid, please come see me after the church, or after, after church, I have the form. All right, for that. Uh, is there any more announcements that we need to make mention of today? All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for all the ways that you love and bless us today. Father, we just... Uh, pray this morning, Lord, that you would be present in this place, Lord, that uh, you would um, be exalted today, Lord. Father, we pray that you speak through Tracy, that you speak through uh, the band today. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Stand if you will, let's sing, my eyes have seen the glory. <laughs> Thank you. 
God and a good God, do we not? No matter what we're dealing with, no matter what problems we have, and I'm sure we all have them, I do as well, but we've got a good God who loves us, and in spite of who we are, He still loves us. Amen. I serve so He could Man's empty praise and treasures that fade. You came along, put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. There's nothing better.
Jesus Christ is Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He's my Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He's my Lord. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house to worship you, to lift you up as our almighty God. We owe everything to you, not a single breath that we have comes from ourselves. Lord, just ask your blessings upon us. We ask your healing for those that are on our prayer list. Ask for comfort. Lord, thank you for each witness in this place. Thank you for their strength that's provided by you. Lord, we ask that you, we just want to lift up our country and the leaders. We know that they're appointed by you and that there's a reason for everything that happens. And Lord, we just ask for a returning or a revival in this country that would lead our, our people back to you to lift you up. Lord, give us righteous leaders that would, would do your will. Lord, it's a long, hot summer. We know that it's it's August in that season, but we just pray that you would provide us with an occasional rain to relieve us from the heat and the dryness. Our fields need it. Our attitudes need it. Lord, I ask your, that you bless our pastor Tracy as he delivers this message. May you speak through him to each and every one of us. And if there be anyone in this house that's not a believer in your son, Jesus Christ, we ask that their ears and their heart would be open to this message and make a decision. Lord, we ask that you bless this offering, use it to your will. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made for us. Thank you for the love that he provides to us, though undeserving. Thank you for the grace and the mercy. These things we ask in his name. Amen. A little disclaimer. I was working on this song earlier in the week. And I don't think my wife will mind me saying this, but she looked at me. She goes, you going to do that Sunday? I said, I might. She goes, that sounds like something you'd do to, to do it that quickly. Um, anyhow, so I thought, well, that might be a, something I should think about. So I went to Tracy this morning, and I said, uh, there's a song called Goodness of God. We've sang before. We heard it at D-Now. Uh, do you think I ought to do it this morning? She says, yeah, let's do it. So we're, we're going to do it. So if, if you hear uh, the chorus part of it and you want to sing along at some point, feel more than free to. Yeah. 
All the children may go to follow their leaders. The goodness of God is worthy of a glory, isn't it? Glory. 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 Today we want to look at another one of the miracles of Christ. If you will, turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 8 again. <clears throat> Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Before we begin reading, let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness and your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercies that are without measure. Your love is beyond anything we can imagine. Father, we pray today that as we gather that we may embrace that love, that we may embrace you, that we would exalt you and lift you up. Father, I pray that you would use me for your honor and your glory. Speak through me. Don't let me mess up and get in your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Beginning in verse 22 of Mark chapter 8. 
and he came to Bethsaida, and they brought him a blind man and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. He looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into town nor tell it to any that are in town. <clears throat> After reading that text, some people come away with the thought that Jesus didn't quite get it right the first time, so he had to have a do-over. And it's possible because we're unable to comprehend the infinite knowledge and the infinite power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We might think that because of his humanity might have caused him not to necessarily get it wrong, but not to get it completely right so that a realignment or a second touch was necessary. I hope that before this day is over that you will be convinced that Jesus does not need do-overs. The second touch was a necessary part of a three-touch plan that was custom designed for this individual. For in all of Christ's miracles, we see various procedures employed. For some, he healed by the spoken word. For some, he healed by touch. Others touched the hem of his garment. And at least one occasion, he put mud in the eyes of the blind. And we'll cover that one. I think Brandon's covering that one next week. I would liken Christ's procedure here for giving sight to the blind to how he brings us out of spiritual darkness into the glorious light of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that he touched him first to lead him from town. He touched him second that he might spit upon his eyes. He touched him the third time to complete the miracle of giving sight to the blind. And Jesus brings us out of spiritual darkness into light by the similar touches that we will cover today. First of all, we'd like to make mention that he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. Jesus wants to lead you and I away from unbelief. Bethsaida was a town that was under a curse. We will find in Matthew chapter 11, verse 21 and 22, that Jesus said this about Bethsaida, Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. And so it was been a, been a community and a town that had not appreciated the things that Christ had done there, the works that he had done. And so he said uh, other towns would have responded in a much different way and would have repented in, in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. Now, not that it has anything to do with it, but Bethsaida is no longer a community. It's been destroyed uh, and is no longer a viable community anymore. But they were under the judgment of God because they had not responded to the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and to the works that he had done. In essence, he said, Bethsaida is not, worth, not worthy of witnessing the works of Christ within her walls. Now from that, I'd like for us to give some thought to, may we remember to show the proper appreciation for the graces and the mercies of God, lest we forfeit the privileges of receiving and witnessing those mercies. We are a church that has been magnificently blessed. God has done great and wonderful things here in a few short years. He's done amazing things. I was thinking as we were listening to the special Dolphatory a moment ago, God has blessed us with some very talented people. We're willing to use those talents for his honor and glory. We need to be people that give thanks and praise to God for those that he sent and for what God has done in our midst. If we want to continue to see people saved, continue to see the baptismal water spread, Third, we need to give thanks and give praise to God for those that he's already touched and those things that he's already done. We need to be people 
that are appreciative of the works of Christ. He led him from town so that he could deal with him on a personal level. Jesus wants to deal with you and I on a personal level. I, as I was working on this sermon, I started to say, we don't find any instances of Jesus doing group healings. But I had to take that back because there was one occasion when he did a group healing. There were ten lepers and he healed them all at the same time. But only one of them responded in a positive way. We need to be people that Jesus can, can deal with on a personal level. He promised the disciples when he, before he went away that the coming of the Holy Spirit would come in John 16 and 8. And the Holy Spirit would... Uh, bring about conviction of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And he uses that in our lives and gets our attention so that he might change our lives. As I was thinking about it, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit, and if you're saved, you've, you've had dealings with the Holy Spirit because he singles you out. I liken it unto a cutting horse. And some of you are not familiar perhaps with a cutting horse competitions, but a cutting horse can go into a small herd of cattle and can separate one cow or one calf and cut it out of that herd and it keeps it cut from getting, tries its best to get back to the herd and the cutting horse stays between it and the herd. And it's, it's quite a competition. They're quite athletic, those, those horses that are trained to do such. I had the opportunity of riding one one time unaware. I wasn't in competition. But the horse knew more about what he was doing than I did. And a cow cut back from a herd of cows. And the next thing I knew, I was trying to catch up to the saddle. Uh, I didn't make it. I ended up behind the horse. But uh, they, they're in a similar way, the Holy Spirit cuts us out of the herd. And no matter what you do or what you move, which way you move, what kind of excuse you throw up, the Holy Spirit's there to separate you so that Christ can deal with you on a personal level. When he's dealing with this and bringing about conviction in our heart, no matter what kind of excuse you throw up, he's still got an answer for you and he's still, he's still there dealing with us in order that he might bring us to faith in Christ. He keeps us cut from the herd. The second touch we see, I compare it to that of the touch of conversion. When he spit on the man's eyes and he put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. This conversion took place immediately. He was moved from a position of darkness to light. There was a regeneration of his eyes. Now, his eyes weren't perfected. They weren't uh, as they should be. They weren't completely healed but they have moved from that of darkness to that of light. Likewise, in our lives, when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, we have to make a decision. We will either accept the Lord Jesus Christ and accept the penalty that he paid for us at the cross, or we will reject that. If we accept it, immediately we are moved into light. We are moved into the family of God. It is a spiritual regeneration that takes place and it, it takes place immediately. Jesus, speaking to Nicodemus, made the statement, said, you must be born again. Nicodemus didn't understand that. How can any grown man enter into the womb again and be born again? And Jesus went on to explain to him, he said, this is a spiritual thing, and that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. But I want you to know that when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, immediately the Spirit of God enters you and there's a rebirth and there's a beginning of a new spirit that is born within you. The old spirit is passed away and the new spirit begins to take place. But like the, like the blind man, sometimes our vision's not quite clear. I've heard people say through the years as a, as a minister, I've always been a Christian. Now, in most cases when I hear that, I don't pay any attention to it. I just go on and give them the plan of salvation, tell them how to be saved, because quite frankly, it's impossible for you to always be a Christian. 
because the Bible says clearly that all that sin and come short of the glory of God, there's none that escaped that, none of it has escaped the sinful nature that we inherited from Adam. We all have to come to that point in our life where we recognize we're sinners. The first thing that the Holy Spirit convicts you of when he is convincing you of Christ is he convicts you of your sin. You are a sinner. Everyone here today is either a born-again believer because they were a sinner or you're still in your sins, but you are a sinner one way or another. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. God uses a variety of methods to lead us from death to life. Now, it's very interesting, and I, I enjoyed it. One of the things that made our last fellowship such a, a success is hearing the testimony of different believers. But Christ brings us all to faith in different ways. The God deals with us in much different ways. Some of us he deals with as six, eight, ten-year-old kids. Others he deals with as adults. Uh, some of them he saves in foxholes. Others he saves in hospital beds. Uh, but God has his places that he uses in order that he might bring us to faith in the Lord Christ. He uses a variety of methods. And I, I pray that in your testimony that you groom your testimony. That you take what God has done in your life and you make it presentable so that you might share with other people. When you go out to witness to others as Christ has commanded us to, he said, go into all the world and take the gospel with you, take the good news with you. And when you do that, folks, aren't, they're not as interested in hearing you thump your Bible and, and quote how many verses as they are and what God's done in your life. People want to see and experience the same change in themselves as they see in you. They want to know the joy and the peace of God. They want to know the strength of God. So I, I encourage you to share your testimony and uh, to groom that testimony and so that it's presentable so that others may want to come to know Christ as you know. The third touch was the touch of correction. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. There's so much more to the Christian life than just a conversion. So much more than just a conversion. This past week, somebody sent me a video of a popular evangelist preacher named Francis Chan. I know he's good at youth groups. And I, I know Brandon is familiar with him. But in this, in this video, this preacher was up on stage and he paced about, about like Brandon does and he had a baby bottle in his mouth and he was sucking on, on that baby bottle and he was preaching. So many of God's people, and the point he was making, so many of God's people are still babes in Christ because they simply won't pick up the word of God. They won't read it. They won't study it. They won't implement it into their lives. We need to be people who are familiar with the things God is doing. We need to be people who know the word of God. And God will use that word to transform you. In Romans chapter 8, it says that you were chosen by God and you were predestined to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus Christ, God has predestined you to be changed into the image of Christ. Now, that's not to physically look like him but it is to have the same characters, the same qualities, the same righteousness. And if that's not taking place, I want you to listen to me. If that's not taking place in your life, if he's not changing you, you need to check out your salvation because God is not a failure in what he's placed into his word and said you're going to be conformed into the image of Christ. If that's not taking place, you're not one of his children. He'll either change you or he'll take you away from this world, one or the other. But he's going to accomplish his will and his purpose in our lives. We need to be people who are touched by the hand of God in correction. Will you allow 
the Lord Jesus Christ to continue to touch you until your day of completion. Philippians 6 says that we're being worked on, we're working, we're working progress, that we're being changed daily until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's only by our will we submit to the authority of Christ and allow him to do those things that he wants to do in our life. Will you continue to allow Christ to touch and correct you of your faulty sight? And will you embrace the light and the goodness of God that he presents to you today? Bow with me for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, And although the message has been very brief, Father, there's a message there for each one of us that we need to be touched by your hand, whether in salvation or in correction, but that you would bring light and liberty into our life. Father, I pray that you would move through this congregation today by your Holy Spirit and that you would call us to a repentant life, whether we're your children or whether we're not, that we would repent of our sins and turn toward you and allow you to make changes in our life. Touch us, Lord, again. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.